Welcome, everybody. We are so excited for today's um, June webinar, which is going to feature some market updates and more. Um, at Kennedy Financial Group, we really make it a priority to help make the complex simple. Um, finances can be one of those things that are a little bit uh, tricky and get into so you can get into some areas that are a little bit hard to navigate so we want to make it as easy as possible for people to navigate those difficult topics and um you know lately we've been receiving a lot of questions that i think today we are super excited to have ryan detrick here from lpl financial who's going to help answer those for us um, he is the senior vice president and chief market strategist at lpl and again we are super excited to have him so let's dive in um, just to do some housekeeping these are the disclosures that we always have to share with you but also i just want to say again um i know that a lot of people especially since covid um the restrictions have been lifted and people are going back to work more and more people are um watching these the pre as they've been uh, recorded and sent out as opposed to viewing them live but if you do have any questions during the presentation you can text them to us at 248-528-0485 and we will um, ask Ryan at towards the end of the presentation to answer those for us. Or at the end of today's presentation, we're going to give a little bit of a preview of what we'll be talking about in July. And if you have questions that you think would be good for that presentation, you can send those to us as well. That way, if you don't plan on watching live, you plan on watching the pre-recorded version, you can still get your questions answered. Um, so just to give a little bit of a preview. My name is Lauren. I am the Director of Client Experience here at Kennedy Financial Group. Um, I am super happy to have Brandon Kennedy, who is our President and Wealth Advisor with us today, who's going to give a brief introduction into who we are at, LP, or at Kennedy Financial Group. And I am super excited to um, have Ryan Dietrich here, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Market Strategist at LPL Financial. Um, Yes, I saw, we've got a question that popped up about adding the number to the chat and I will add that in just a moment. Um, just to get into a little bit of what we're gonna talk about today, we have been receiving so many questions on the state of the market currently, as well as things like inflation and um, even getting into kind of some of the Hesitancies that people have with a new administration, even though we're halfway through the year, we're still early on in this administration and um, kind of some questions that people have about what might change for them. And we asked someone who we think is absolutely an expert on these topics, Ryan Dietrich here to um, share a little bit more about his thoughts on that and our stance on it as well. And um, as per usual, we're going to get into a little bit of first about who Kennedy Financial Group is. So I'm going to pass it over to Brandon and you can take it from here. Uh, yeah, excited to, to chat today with Ryan. And before we jump into why everybody's here, uh, just a quick recap of Kennedy Financial. For those that are new, uh, I know a lot of newer uh, people kind of kicking the tires and learning about Kennedy Financial are uh, you know listening in today. So. Uh, just a, a quick overview. Started in 2008. Uh, been doing this as an independent financial advisory firm. We serve 400 clients, work on a lot of small business retirement plans, have 50 years of combined experience, and uh, you know, really just uh, uh, it, you know, here to serve those people who are looking for a plan and a process behind making financial decisions. Uh, we're also a Dave Ramsey Smartvester Pro affiliated with LPL Financial. Uh, that's where Ryan's coming from today. Uh, so, you know, our, our why, why we exist as a firm, and this is, you know, the passion behind everything that we do, we exist to inspire people to live their best and most fulfilling financial life. And that means a lot of different things for all of the 400 families that we work with. Some people just want to not worry about money and know that they are at a point and have a plan that they're financially independent and money is not their issue. Uh, others are, are just trying to get their kids through school and, and not have the burden of, of student loans that maybe they had. Um, and, and then for a lot of our families, it goes beyond that. And money is, uh, they're comfortable with the money they have and the income that they have. And they want to change their family tree. They want to 
leave a legacy. And, and uh, we just really love having those conversations and, and just listening intently to who our clients are and, and how they define winning with their money and creating a plan to help them really succeed on how they define uh, a successful financial life. Uh, so that's kind of our why. How do we do that? We act as guides uh, because every every financial journey is different. It's it's we're, we're, There's a process to get there. There's really no end. It's an ongoing process, and, and we are there as your guide. Uh, we actually just got back from Outer Banks and did a, a charter fishing trip, and um, just a, a quick story. So we, we walk up to the dock. It was a small little charter boat, uh, six of us. It was my boys and uh, a couple of friends and, and, and their kids. And uh, we walk out on the boat. The captain jumps onto the dock. It was a really windy day, a lot of big storms in, in North Carolina. And he jumps out and says, hey, we can go to the ocean today. There's a sound side and an ocean side. And he says, uh, we can go out, out onto the ocean, but we'll probably die. And, and that was our, 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 our intro to hopping on a boat with this stranger. Um, but he, he said it with such confidence, and, and obviously he was being humorous. We ended up going on the sound side because it was a windy day. But that trip was amazing because of the guide. We saw people who rented their own boats. One of them actually got stuck because uh, the, the tide had come in and they got stuck on a sandbar that they didn't know was there. Uh, we saw other boats driving back and, and they didn't catch any fish and they looked kind of bummed. We had an amazing four hour trip because we went with somebody who had experience, who knew the waters, who knew how to navigate different environments. That day wasn't a day to go on the ocean. Um, and, and that's what we are as advisors, right? We are your guide. We have experience. We have resources. Um, we have confidence in the plan that we put together that is unique to what our clients tell us they want to do. Uh, and, and we really embrace that role uh, of being a guide. We do that through a simple process. It's we, we, we listen and we really get to know our clients and what's important to them through our discovery process. Then we create a plan and, and act as the guide uh, and then ongoing engagement and talking through what course corrections do we need to make? What, what has changed in your plan and how do we help you get there? Uh, and we do that through an amazing team. I, I am humbled every day by the, the passion, the resources, the experience that our team has. Uh, and they're really just there to serve our clients and to give them the best experience possible. Uh, and, and again, just, just thrilled to come to work every day with such a, a great group of people. And we live out these core values. Uh, one of those that I'm going to highlight today, make the complex simple. Ryan Dietrich from LPL is incredible. His job through LPL research and a chief market strategist it, it, that, that can become so technical and so complicated uh, that it kind of becomes meaningless to us as advisors even and, and certainly the clients that, that we serve. And he just does an incredible job and that's why we're so excited to have him today. But these are some of the other core values that, that we live out and, and hopefully you, you see that today with Ryan, um, you know, talking through making the complex simple, talking through investments and markets and, uh, you know, kind of kind of looking back at some history and looking for, forward looking. Uh, how do we take all this complicated news and data and, and make it simplified so we can make some good decisions on? So we're super thrilled to have Ryan. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren in just a second to give a proper introduction to to Ryan with his bio and all that. But um, hey, Ryan, how's it going? That was um, one of the nicer intros I've ever had. So you set the bar high. Oh, uh, I'm not even done. Like, so Ryan is is a big deal. He's a, uh, Lauren's going to give his whole bio, but he's a, a frequent CNBC uh, a contributor. He's just, a, I, I listen to him every week on, on research. Um, yeah, he, he's, he's the real deal. Uh, Lauren and I were joking. We were pretty proud and, and excited to have him. Um, we we're kind of throw in some anchorman quotes. We, we, we anticipate his apartment, uh, uh, you know, has many leather bound books and <laughs> smells of rich mahogany. Uh, people know Ryan. He, he's a big deal. So now I set you up even more. I'm going to turn, turn it over to Lauren to introduce Ryan and, uh, yeah. and then we'll kind of get started. Yep. We are so excited to have Ryan here today. He is the uh, senior vice president and chief market strategist a member of the LPL Financial Research Tactical Asset Allocation Committee and is responsible for directly impacting the portfolio decision-making process, as well as a member of the Market Insights team. 
who works as developing and articulating equity and general market strategy. In this role, he is a frequent presenter to clients, industry peers, and the national media on emerging, emerging and developing market trends. He has made appearances on business and television radio programs such as CNBC, Bloomberg TV, and Fox Business. Um, Mr. Dietrich earned his Chartered Market Technician designation, a BS in Finance from Xavier University, and an MBA from Miami University. He also holds his FINRA Series 7 and 66 through LPL Financial. So thank you so much, Ryan, for being here today. Um, you are going to talk about uh, a lot of things that are way over my head, but I know just from previewing your slides, I said to Brandon that I was really excited to see what you talked about because these slides might be the funniest I've seen of any presenter that we've had. So <laughs> yeah. again, talking about making the complex simple, we're super excited to have you and I'm going to um, let you take it from here. All righty. Well, thank you, Lauren. I, I appreciate it there, Brandon. Also, uh, everyone out there, thank you. Um, I do like to add some humor. Yeah, let's be honest. The Fed, inflation, you know, this stuff, you can talk about it for a little bit. It kind of gets boring after a while. I'll, we're going to talk about it. I mean, this, we're talking about our finances and your retirement and your future. So I'm not saying that's boring, but sometimes getting into the weeds is a little boring. So we're going to have some fun, guys, for the next 30 minutes or so. Um, so it's hopefully technology works. Boom, it worked. All right, so here we go. Um, I like to use cartoons to explain what's going on because I understand cartoons. So let's use one for last year. Lady says to her husband, if we're going to watch the news, I'll need my glasses. So she gets up, comes back, and she has her glasses. I think it's safe to say 2020 was probably a, a double fisting type of year. Um, the good news, though, is, you guys know, I mean, literally, I think like as we speak, the S&P 500 is like right at an all-time high. Dow's right there. NASDAQ's right there. Economy's coming back. There are some real positive things happening. We're not minimizing just how bad things still are and how bad things were last year. But again, things things are looking pretty good. And at LPL Research in general, you follow the kind of stuff that I do. And by the way, I'm on CNBC tomorrow at 8 o'clock so in the morning. So if you guys get Eastern time, so you get up tomorrow at 8 o'clock, um, you'll know exactly what I'm going to say because I'm pretty much going to tell you everything I know today. And I'll say it again tomorrow in like 30 seconds. Um, but so that, that's kind of fun. Um, so, but again, there's just really positive things that I know, you know, we got a lot to discuss. I talk kind of fast. I get excited. I love this. this I love doing this stuff. So we're just going to move into it. But that was last year. Let's go to the future now. And there it is. Boom. So there I am, Ryan Dietrich, Chief Market Strategist, been with LPL for five years. Um, went to Xavier University in Cincinnati, and my college roommate, who I'm still friends with and text with every once in a while, he's from Troy, Michigan. I know you right up there by the office in Troy, Michigan. Um, so I thought that was pretty small world, I guess is what we'll, what we'll say there. Um, lived in Cincinnati for about 20 years, did market stuff and LPL research. LPL Financial needed a market technician. Uh, or a chief market strategist, I'm sorry, I should say. And I was out there and, and one thing led to another, moved my family to the Charlotte area. I'm standing in Fort Mill, South Carolina in York County right now at our office. York County is one of the fastest growing counties in the United States. Fort Mill, the city I'm in, is the one of the top five fastest growing cities in the United States under 20,000 people. All those people like me, you're moving down where there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of good paying jobs. And uh, honestly, weather's pretty nice too. So I can't complain there. Although it's like 94 degrees today, but that's just kind of what it is living in South Carolina. Um, so remember this guy, Little Hercules. He was big about 20 years ago. Well, still big probably, but he was big in the news. So he obviously, he's like 12 years old there. Okay, let's just, let's make this real simple. 12-year-olds shouldn't look like that. He's gone on record and talked about what that did to his body today. It really did a number on him, right? He grew too fast, too soon. Just did, you know, all this stuff to his body when it was supposed to be growing and maturing. And, yeah, he made a lot of money and he was very famous. And his dad had him flying around the country, literally would do push-ups. People pay money and they'd eat food and, you know, he'd do push-ups for him. I mean, like, that's what his job was. Now, today, he doesn't look anything like that. Looks more like a normal person. Still pretty physically fit. He works, like, at SeaWorld. He's one of the stunt guys, you know, the guys that jump in the air and go through the shark's mouth and all that stuff. That's, uh, that's what he does now. But, again, what he talks about, he's, you know, it really, really did a number on him by growing too much too fast. Now, ever heard of this guy, Robert Wadlow, almost nine foot tall, one of the tallest human beings, or no, probably the tallest human being we've ever seen on our earth, right? Pituitary issues, you can see there, obviously extremely tall. 
The sad thing about him, grew too fast, too much too soon. He died at 23 years old, a horrible death. He, he His legs like split open, the bones split open. He had to use a cane and, and crutches. Imagine how tall the crutches the guy uses, six foot tall crutches, um, the last couple of years of his life. So this hu- superhuman looking person, yet extremely weak and brittle because, again, he grew too fast and did too much. If you look at like a redwood trees out in Oregon, so, right, the big trees, if they don't have like mommy and daddy trees around them, they'll grow super fast. You know what happens, though, like 10, 20 years later? Those trees are much more likely to get an infection, get something wrong with them, rot out and die because they didn't grow slowly. The trees that grow slow are mommy and daddy trees that kind of hog some of the sunlight. Those grow and they form a really, really good base, right? That's what you need. So what I'm getting at is you grow too far too fast. It's not always a good thing. Now I'm going to bring this back to what in the world is this guy talking about? The stock market. There's something called secular bull markets and secular bear markets. All you got to know is this. And this chart is a long-term chart of the S&P 500. There have been periods for decades when stocks have gone higher. There have been periods for decades when stocks literally go sideways. So let's just look at that first shaded area on the left there. 1950 to 1968, 18-year bull market. All right. Then you see the next shaded area, 80 to 2000, 20 year bull market. What happened in the 70s, though? High inflation, virtually no gains after the Great Depression from 1920, 1929 peak till 1954, 25 years, stock market went nowhere. You get these big cycles. Now, what I want to talk about is the seven year itch. You've all heard about it, right? After seven years, you get tired of a relationship, a job, a car. The stock market's kind of human. I know there's a lot of computers out there anymore. But listen to this. See the first circle in red on the left there, 1957? Seven years in a recession and a bear market. Go to the next secular bull market that kicked off in 1980. Add seven to 1980, and what do you get? 1987, a 34% correction, similar to the 34% correction we just saw last year, and then eventually moved back higher, but the seven-year itch. Now, Fast forward to the 2000s, all right? The 2000s were a worse decade for stocks in the 30s. I'll say that again. The 2000s were worse for stock investors in the 30s, all right? So that's terrible. We all had to live through it, right? That's just part of investing. That just sometimes, sometimes are good, sometimes times are bad. Well, that was one of the worst we've ever seen. The good news is we planted those seeds. We, we grew, the roots were strong, the base was strong after th- years from 2000 to 2013 the S&P went literally nowhere then it broke out in 2013 add seven to 2013 and what do you get the seven-year itch we had no idea at LPL research that we would have a 34 percent correction in 21 business day or trading days uh, the fastest bear market ever fastest 30 percent correction ever vicious most vicious um recession since Great Depression all that stuff what we did know, though, was coming in last year, the seven-year itch was potentially something that was out there. But what ha- what did Mark Twain tell us? History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. If history's rhyming, what's happened after the seven-year itch multiple times? Stocks went up from 57 to 68, and stocks went up from 87 to 2000. You could have, we could have potentially another decade of stock gains. And I know that sounds crazy. But again, the reason we're so optimistic in a secular bull market is because how horrible from 2000 to 2013, stocks went nowhere for 13 years. And now we've got this major base and we just had the seven-year itch. So this is a big picture view of the world. Believe me, more short-term. I probably got a little more concerned short-term, but now we can talk about that. But if you're long-term investment holders looking to retire in 5, 10, 15 years, guys, Things look really good, and any wall, any and all weakness probably is going to be led to eventual newer highs down the road. So, long, long-winded. I spent a lot of time on that chart. I think it's important. Regis Philbin, big fan of him. He said, "I'm involved in the stock market, which is fun and sometimes very painful." Unfortunately, Regis passed away recently. I think that sums up the stock market more than anything in the world. Right when it's making new highs, everybody's happy. There's not a care in the world, and then boom. You get a 20% bear market. You get a 10% correction, whatever it is. And then you start feeling like, oh, my goodness, you know, my statement, my, my money, lose some money here. That's that's not fun. We're, we're connected to our money, unlike just about anything we're connected to. Um, remember the uh, Pavlov's dogs? You ring that little bell, the dog starts slobbering. That was a study. There was a horrible flood in Leningrad, I think, in 1924 or 23. And tragically, a lot of the dogs died. 
during this horrible flood. Some of them lived. They had to swim to safety. They lived. After the flood, everything calmed down. Pavlov started his um, his um, studies once again. You know what happened? He rang the bell. The dogs did not slobber. They forgot what they were supposed to do because it was stressful. Guys, in times of stress, we make the worst decisions possible. I could tell you that stocks usually go up every 10 years. Stocks usually go up every 20 years, 30 years. In the midst of March 2020, if you didn't need that money for a couple decades, you might not have believed me because you just see it going down and we make bad decisions. That's why it's so important. But Brandon was just saying to have a plan in place, you know, to, to leverage you know, Kennedy and to leverage Brandon and, and your financial advisor to make sure you got a plan for when the bad times happen, you don't make a bad decision. And it's not your fault. It's not anybody's fault. It's the way our brains are wired. And Pavlov's dog showed that 100 years ago. And it's the truth. I can't tell you how many people I talk to, not just at LPL, personally, everybody knows, oh, he's a stock market guy. I can't tell you how many people reach out to me in March. And I'm selling, I'm selling, I'm selling, I'm selling. I'm just like, listen, you know, <laughs> Here's what I'm doing. I upgraded up my 401k. You know, like I was trying to put more money in. I had no idea if the stock market was going to bottom up to 20%, 30%. But if you have a long enough horizon and that plan in place, then that's what uh, that's that's the benefits of, of you know, why what we're doing today, right? Just the fact that you know Brandon and the team reached out to me and have me here that says a lot. All right, that's that, it shows they they care, yes, but you know they're they're trying to find different ways to communicate and show what's going on out there. Because here's the truth: nobody really knows what's going to happen. I mean, if we did, we'd own an island, right? I mean, I wouldn't be here right now. But you know, we've got a 30 person research team that manages almost 60 billion dollars. We've got a really really good track record. We were the only broker dealer in the United States that upgraded our view on equities the last week of March 2020. Just you remember that was in the midst of the crisis. The Fed came out. We'll talk about the Fed and all the geeky stuff soon enough. The Fed came out and said they're backstopping everything. We upgraded our view on equities. We added equity risk in the depths of the, the, the crisis last year. It was the most uncomfortable call I've ever had to make of my career. But looking back, the money that we run, we see how we're doing versus our peers. People like JP Morgan, Any Alta, you know, Cougar, all these companies you've probably heard of that manage a lot of money, Citigroup, all of them. Um, we see how we're doing versus them and little old LPL, although we're a pretty big company. Um, our 30 person research team though has much better track record the last one, three, and five years than any of these big institutions. And I think it's proof that you don't need to have a big research department. You just need to have the right research department. And um, uh, we're really, really proud of that. Um, so let's, I got to start showing some slides here to make sure we, I think I could talk all day on this stuff. Oh, here we go. This is what I was talking about. All right. This is if any slide I show you. Remember this one. The longer you're willing to hold something when it comes to stocks, you're probably going to get your money back and even then make a lot, right? Every one year, um, the S&P is up two thirds of the time. Okay, you know, it's not too bad. Check it out. Three years later, up 80% of the time. 10 years later, 87% of the time. If you're willing to hold for 25 years, I know that's a long time. I get it. But still, if you're willing to, it's just the purpose of this is, you know, when you have these big pullbacks, I mean, if you buy at a peak, like the peak of 29 or the peak of 2000, yeah, well, you might have to wait sometimes. And no one knows when the peak is. But if you're willing to buy something when it's down 10, 20, 30%, guys, these numbers are astronomically even higher. All right, there's an old saying, the stock market's the only place where people run out of the store screaming when things go on sale. And I, I do this for a living, I've done it for 22 years now. That is absolutely the truth. And, and it's hard. I mean, I'm not thinking it's how like this is easy. I mean, it's hard when things are going down and you're losing money. Um, but you just have to remember charts like this. If you've got the long-term horizon using Brandon and the team to make sure you're um, you know, protecting yourself from yourself a lot of times. George Burns, big fan of him. I look to the future because that's where I'm going to spend the rest of my life. So let's enough about 2020 and what we, where we are. Let's get to where we see things headed. So we called our outlook 2021 powering forward. Now I'll be honest, this came out, you know, January or so. We are literally putting the final touches on our mid-year outlook. Like as we speak, that comes out in like two weeks, but I'm going to talk to you about how we see the world right now. The imagery is what we shared, you know, six months ago. And I think it's pretty cool imagery. Um, you know, we said the only way to go is powering forward. We're calling a mid-year outlook, which again comes out on, I think it's July 13th, um, picking up speed, right? That's what we're calling the next outlook, Pick because that's what it is. We powered forward. Now we're picking up speed. I mean, the economy, the stock market, things are really, really come back. We're going to talk about policy for a little bit. So policy is like the government, taxes, spending, the Fed, those things. They pull a lot of levers that can keep things moving. One of the popular questions you probably have in the back of your head, or some of you do, if there's higher taxes, that's got to be bad, right? Like higher taxes, they don't sound good. 
Well, we took a look historically. You can see on the screen um, when you have higher capital gains taxes, like are likely coming probably this year or, or definitely next year. Um, you know, stock market um, in 1969 and 1960, uh, 1976, as you can see there, six months, 12 months later, negative returns. Check out the most recent two times, though, late 86, early 2013. Six months later, 12 months later, pretty darn good returns. Here's the truth. In the mid 70s, 70s and uh, 70s in general, the economy was growing okay. You had massive inflation. Things weren't really that great. Versus 87, you had a humming economy. In 2013, economy was okay, but a really accommodative Fed. Guys, we've got an accommodative Fed and we've got a humming economy. The truth is the economy is strong. It can withstand a lot of things. And our take is, yeah, higher taxes are coming. I mean, that's we know that, right? I mean, how high they are, how much is going to be. Listen, that's that's Washington making it's making how the sausage is made. But the economy is strong enough that it can withstand those. And and likely your your investments specifically, um, in stocks at least should do should continue to do really well. And the economy is what matters. The Fed, you've heard of the Fed. We'll keep this real simple. There's Jerome Powell there. He's on 60 Minutes like every month. I've never seen a Fed president that goes on or a Fed chairperson goes on TV more than he does. But that's a good thing. He's out there, man. He's he's saying what the Fed thinks. And here's let's make it. That's the Fed balance sheet. You've all heard about the Fed printing money, right? That's the Fed balance sheet. That's what they're talking about. Almost seven trillion dollars is a Fed balance sheet of mortgage backed securities and long term treasuries mainly. And uh, it is what it is. I know a lot of people don't like the Fed for a lot of reasons, but the truth is this: as a steward of assets. When the Fed came out on March 23rd of 2020 and said they were going to backstop everything, that was what LPL Research needed to see to give the green light to start to add more equities, significant equities, actually. And the Fed a, is a tailwind. And you don't have to like them, right? But again, what the Fed is doing, low rates, keeping things going, keeping confidence going, it's, it's historically a tailwind and a beneficial um, environment for stocks. I'm not saying it's good for the economy. We saw the Fed do something similar last decade from 2010, the, you know, the cri crisis starting with low rates and things like that. It didn't really help the economy all that much. I think there's other things that can help the economy. But from the Fed's point of view, what they're doing, they're trying to help uh, equity prices and risky assets increase in appreciation to bring back confidence. And that's, again, something that's a tailwind in our opinion. Let's see what else we have here. Um, it's not me who can't keep a secret. It's the people I tell who can't, Honest Abe. And I don't think that's a real picture of Honest Abe, but those are some pretty cool glasses. Here's the secret. that The Fed is called monetary policy. Maybe you heard of that. Well, we're talking fiscal policy for a second. Think the CARES Act, right? All the different ways we're trying to help people that have been impacted by this. The amount of stimulus we've seen from the government, $5 trillion with a T, $5 trillion. That's six times more than the stimulus we saw during the financial crisis. All right, and there's more coming, right? You, you know, every day you turn it on and there's some new drama about the, uh, the infrastructure plan. There's a trillion, trillion and a half dollars coming on infrastructure sometime, eventually here, it's gonna come. And, and again, this is then versus now, right? Then was orange, now is yellow. Well, there's more stimulus in the system as a percent of GDP, that's just as a percent of the economy, uh, now than there was then. Again, a tailwind for economic growth. So that's policy. Now we're going to talk about more of the economy, but really policy and the economy, they're kind of intertwined a lot anymore. So we called it a new start. And honestly, this is again for six months ago. Now it's really humming along if you think about how things are going. John Maynard Key said this, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? That's a, that's a really good quote. His other quote was, in the long run, we're all dead. I don't know what to think of that quote, but it's it's true. Um, but that the quote we got on the page there, you know, LPL Research, we've upgraded our view on the U.S. economy twice this year already, February and March. We were one of the more optimistic, bullish shops out there on the street coming into this year. And then you come in and things are even better than we expected, like a lot better than we expected. But again, the facts change. We change our mind. What do you do, sir? So you can be you can be just stuck in your, put your heels down and kind of fight what the market's doing, or you can just accept what the market's doing and do your best to create long-term wealth for, for your clients. That's exactly what we're doing here. And that's why we've uh, kind of upgraded our view a couple of different times here. Here's our view on, on, the, on overall growth this year. Here's what you got to know. U.S. might grow upwards of 7% this year. Guys, that's the best year since 84. If we go a little bit higher, we could be looking at the best year of economic growth since 1952. Now, full disclaimer, 
last year was the worst year for economic growth since the Great Depression. So we're making that up. But but still, I mean, things like retail sales and housing sales and auto sales, all used cars, all that stuff, it's soaring, right? I mean, it, things have really, really come back much faster than anyone obviously expected. Um, and we could be looking at the best year of economic growth for the entire world in like five decades. So again, just a really impressive comeback, no doubt about it. I love this chart. We've sh I've shared it many for for a while now. Um, the idea of uh, economic cycles they last a while. So here you see the, all the previous economic cycles since World War II. How long they lasted? The last one lasts about eleven years. Um, this one is like a year old. We don't officially know when this one started yet. When the when the, technically we're in a recession. Nobody in their right mind believes that. Um, but there's a company that or an institute that, that call, calls it recessions, non-recessions. Um, but likely it started about a year ago, sometime last summer. All right. So let's just say this expansion's a year old. Just make this easy. Year old of growth um, without a recession. The average is five years. Who's to say we can't get to average? We absolutely think we can get to average. Will we get to 10 years of economic growth like the last cycle? We don't think so, right? This wasn't your regular recession. I mean, the LPL research actually grew. I got promoted, all right? If I'd done this a year ago, I'd have a different title. I got promoted in the middle of the pandemic. I just started talking in an office by myself all the time instead of going on airplanes talking to people. You know, LPL grew. There's a lot of companies that grew. My father-in-law in Cincinnati, Ohio has a restaurant. I know all about the, the the problems clearly that happened in that world. I saw Christmas time, you know, worried about his mortgage and how he's going to keep his business afloat. Fortunately, things are opening up and they're doing better. Um, my brother has one of the largest GI Joe collections out of anyone you know. <laughs> he travels to the Holiday Inn Convention Center. Well, that got shut down last year. So it's not lost on me or lost on LPL that, yeah, certain parts of the economy did honestly better probably because of which is weird to say but honestly did better because of what happened uh versus other parts that were totally totally shut down but fortunately starting to come back and that's why we don't think this this is a regular cycle of growth so maybe we hit like five years or so versus the 10 and every time i use the word average i always think of this joke you might like this one there's a statistician and he puts his head in a bucket of ice and his feet in a um in a fire you go, hey how do you feel he goes well on average I feel pretty good. <laughs> so anyway, there you go. Now, inflation could be, along with higher taxes, uh, inflation is one of the top questions we've received at LPL Research the last, we'll call it six months or so, as the economy is heated up. What's inflation? Just means prices cost more, right? Go go, go, go to the grocery store. Things cost more, right? Go um, go buy, like my father-in-law sells wings, chicken wings. There's a chicken shortage, right? Wings cost more. Everything's costing more, all right? Go get gas. It costs more than it did a year ago. Um, again, because we're coming off those major lows. Now, what I want to point out, though, is something on the left. That's Barron's, the I word. That is inflation. That was last month or so. When was it? Maybe it was yeah, May. It was about a month ago in May. On the right is inflation dead. That was just a couple years ago. All right. So, you know, on the one side, everyone's worried about inflation. On the other side, you've got is deflation dead uh, or inflation dead. I'm sorry. And we think, you know, we're not as worried about inflation as some other places. Some people are talking about massive inflation, the Fed's printing money. We get all that stuff. I mean, we're not naive to it. We've written and talked about it extensively at LPL Research with our more than 18,000 advisors. The truth is this, right? I mean, we're here. It is. Here's my phone, right? I could, by the time this is over, I could probably, um, oh, look at that. Literally, I have a Reuters reporter wanting to talk to me. See, that's just that's what I do. I talk to I just talk in a room to people all day. Um, anyway, so where was I with this? Oh, I could order a hot tub. I could literally like order a hot tub, right? That's the ultimate deflationary instrument, right there. The phone, the Amazon effect. Um, you know, some of these things, automation, um, um, machinery, all these things that have really kept a lid on inflation the last ten years. They're still in place, guys. They're still there. So let me get a drink real fast here. So we just do not see massive runaway inflation. More inflation this year than last year, yes. More inflation next year than the year before, probably. But runaway inflation, no, we don't see it because these major structural things are still in play. Now, what side are you on? Whose team are you on? There's team transitory uh, on the left. That's Jerome Powell and our new president, uh, President Biden. And then on the right, you've got team trouble, Larry Summers and um, Will Dudley. Uh, no, Williams, Williams from the New York Fed. They used to be on the New York Fed. Um, now, I think someone in the upper right-hand corner needs to wake up Summers. He's apparently asleep there. But you've got the one side on the right saying, listen, there's a lot of inflation coming. It's going to be bad. All right, Fed's behind the eight ball. We have to hike rates. It's just going to be a bad, bad situation. Like the 70s. Honestly, like the 70s. And then on the left, you got team transitory. We'll see. You know, a lot of history books will be written on this. I'll just say this. I remember 2010, 11, 12, 
A lot of talk about massive inflation then also. We've got more stimulus this time, no doubt about it. Um, but obviously, we didn't have massive inflation then, and that's our base case at LPL Research. Now, let's say um, we have some inflation. We, we've got a blog, lplresearch.com. You all can go to it right now, our public site. Two client-approved blogs a day. I wrote one just today on some different things about July. By the way, you know about this. July is the strongest month of the summer. Usually, summer months aren't that great. July is the best month of the year for stocks in a post-election year. Oh, just some kind of interesting stuff. So that's what I talked about on the blog today. But here's a blog we did. If you wanted to invest in, to protect yourself from inflation, you know, tangible assets, things like real estate and commodities tend to do well. And stocks, I mean, this isn't this isn't like brain surgery. Stocks historically have done better than inflation over the long term, right? So stocks are a really good way. You know, we think value stocks, we like value stocks. Um materials, energy, energy is doing well today as crude oil continues to go higher. Um, those are some groups that can do well. Tips are treasury inflation protection instruments. We'll get too geeky with this, but if inflation goes up, their bonds, they pay you a little bit more. So that's good. And then bank loans on the side of, um, of a fixed income, which I'll talk about here in a little bit, they, they, um, they, they can withstand higher rates and higher inflation. So there you go. So that's kind of some stuff we talk about on our, bond, on our, um, on our website, lplresearch.com. So let's do a few more here and we got to wrap this up and do some Q&A. Um, stocks. We're going to talk about stocks. Earnings rebound may spark 2021 gains. We, <laughs> yes, is the short answer. Six months later, it's like, yes. I mean, the jump we've seen in stocks this year of 15%, really impressive. We've seen earnings actually go up more. So earnings have clearly sparked an incredible bounce. Um, so here's here's kind of how we see the world. Our fair value target in the S&P is 4,400. That's honestly not too far from where we are right now. And people say, ah, just because you're at your fair value target, I mean, you're bearish now? No. Right. We can up our target. I mean, the way, we, way I look at it is this. This is a major structural bull market. Talked about that a little bit ago. Um, you know, the economy keeps improving to the upside, surprising to the upside. We, we think it still be in stocks over bonds. Our big call this year earlier was say stocks will really outperform bonds. They've been really beating bonds a lot. We think that's probably going to continue. I'll talk about bonds. There's always a place for bonds in a portfolio, but we just feel like stocks a little bit over bonds. Um, let's see here. Neil Ferguson said the debt out number living 14 to one, ignore such accumulated experience at your peril. There's a lot we can learn from the past. Um, Churchill said the further into the past I look, the further into the future I can see. I love using past history for a potentially where we're gonna go. Um, I have a podcast, everybody listen to the podcast, LPL Market Signals, Google Play, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube channel, LPL Research YouTube channel, we show the videos there. We've shared a ton of market signals over the past year that are saying, listen, this extremely strong move we saw could lead to a lot higher prices. I've been saying that nonstop for, for a long time now. We're still seeing signs like that. Recently, as you can see, we had one of the best 12-month rallies ever. What happens after good 12-month rallies? Well, sure enough, look at that. Six months later, you need some green, some red, but look at a year later. Big bounces tend to resolve higher eventually over the long run over the course of a year because big bounces take place at the start of bull markets where you likely have more expansion. Remember I said the economic cycle is a year old? We just reached year two of the bull market, and I got some slides on that coming up. But it just still makes sense to us when I mean, you see big picture things like this that stocks very well can continue to do pretty well. Now, I know a lot of you guys are in Michigan, so you might know this one. Take a look at this guy. Don't judge a book by its cover. Who could it be? There it is. Nine-time Super Bowl participant, six-time Super Bowl winner, Tom Brady. The 199th pick in the draft. I know Belichick picked him, and he's a genius, but 199th, you know, hey, kind of lucked into it, if you ask me. But it worked out. Let me get a drink here. So you can't judge a book by its cover, obviously. Which brings us to year two. Everyone thinks, oh, my God. Last year, stocks were up so much, right? It has to come back down. It has to pull back. No, that's not the case. We are in the second year of the bull market. We've had 10 second years of a bull market. Going back to World War II, the stock market's higher every single time. Not all those are big gains, though. I want to be very clear there. Sometimes you have some choppiness. Look at like 2004. Look at 2010. Look at 1983, 84. Those are all second years of bull markets. They're kind of choppy, all right? Just catch your breath. So that's fine. After big rallies, maybe catch your breath the second year of a bull market. But you tend to resolve higher. And that's what this chart shows uh, where the second year of the bull market's usually higher. You usually don't have quite the gains you did during year one, which makes sense. Um, and pullbacks are normal. You can have about a 10% correction or so, which after a 90% rally, I don't think a 10% correction would be that shocking. We just shared this in our weekly market commentary on Monday. 
Uh, we wrote a weekly market commentary for our, our advisors and their clients. Um, and right here, you can see this is this bull market's yellow versus some of the other previous bull markets, best bull markets ever. What happened the next six months or so? You tell me, you look at it. Kind of choppy, right? Rally, and then things get kind of choppy. So again, that's not um, it's not the end, not the end of world stuff. It's just stuff you need to be, be very aware of. So here's earnings. All right, earnings are helping drive this whole thing. We're looking at thirty four percent earnings growth this year and twelve percent next year. Honestly, since the time we did this chart, which is about a month ago, or yeah, about a month ago, it's now like thirty nine percent earnings growth in the United States this year, twenty twenty one, and even more in twenty twenty two. So earnings continue to justify, in our view, uh, this big, big move we've seen in equities. It's not just a U.S. story; it's a global story. Here is developed ex, uh, developed international in the middle, emerging markets, and the United States on the left. The left is earnings that were expected, the percent expected at the start of the year. The orange is what's expected now for the full year. All those are up a lot. U.S. is up more than any of them. U.S. has had more of a comeback economically than anywhere else in the world. But it's a global story, the imp improvement we're seeing in earnings. You know, I won't, I won't even talk about that. We talked enough about earnings. What's one of the worries that are out there? Stuff isn't cheap. All right. I mean, you know, P.E. multiples, it's a geeky way of saying what stuff is worth, what you're paying for, price to earnings multiple. They're the highest they've been since the late 1990s. And people here highest since late 1990s, you start to get pretty worried that, you know, things are pricey. So this is no doubt a potential worry. Um, but again, when we see things like just a new economic cycle of growth, there's still an accommodative Fed, historically low inflation. I mean, I know some of the recent inflation data has been high. We're still low inflation, given where we've been. Um, lower inflation, you tend to see a higher multiple. So again, it's something we're worried about. I'm not overly worried about, but just a, a concern is stocks aren't cheap. Here's the thing, though. Stocks might be uh, not so cheap. Bonds are really expensive, okay? So it's kind of like, which way do you want to go? And I'm going to talk about bonds very, very soon. But again, stocks might be kind of pricey. Bonds are very, very pricey. Uh, with rates so low. Okay, here we go. Good. So we're up the bonds. I'm going to try to wrap this up in two or three minutes and we'll do some Q&A. Um, so staying in their lane, we still think there's absolutely a place for bonds in a portfolio. I like to say like this, sometimes bonds help you stay in your stocks. What do I mean by that? You got some stocks, you got some bonds, maybe a little bit of cash, whatever. Um, you know, if the market gets killed like it did last March when your stocks are down 30, 40%, whatever it was, depending where you were, what'd your bonds do? Bonds probably did pretty well, right? They helped you stay in stocks. Stocks are the best way to create wealth over the long term. So bonds do their job. And bonds can give you some wealth too. Don't get me wrong there. Um, but I think it, that's why it makes sense. But again, how are we constructing our portfolio started this year? We have more stocks relative to bonds. Fortunately, that's really, really worked out the first six months of this year. And we think it can continue. But um, that's kind of where we think bonds are staying in their lane. The 10-year yield has been going higher. Now, it's surprisingly been going lower a little bit lately. We still think interest rates go higher, uh, tightening labor force, um, pu pushing up inflationary pressures. And just keep it simple. Rates go up, bond prices go down. Bonds have one of their worst first quarters ever, all right, in the first quarter of this year because rates went up so much. Um, and we think the 10-year yield can continue to kind of work its way higher the rest of this year, which could pressure bonds. We think bonds might be about flat the rest of this year, which isn't the end of the world. Believe me, that's not, not a terrible thing. Um, but we still think this is more opportunity as it pertains to stocks. Almost done, I swear. Peter Bernstein, diversification is the only rational deployment of our ignorance. I'm a big Peter fan, read a lot of his books. He's saying, let's not outsmart ourselves, stay diversified. Have some bonds, have some cash, have some stocks, maybe, maybe gold, talk to your advisor, you know, whatever. I mean, just, you know, there's different things you can invest in in a, in a proper portfolio globally. You know, I mentioned international, Europe, Japan, those are looking a little bit better. There's some other areas you can invest in. So stay diversified to help with our ignorance. <laughs> I love how Peter says it. And this is just a cool way of showing it. A lot of numbers on here. Look where it says return on the right there. Um, we have big pullbacks in stocks, the S&P 500. Look at Barclays Ag. That's your average bond fund. Bonds usually do pretty good. Treasuries, long-term treasury, that should do really good. Safest instrument there is out there almost. Um, so that's why it makes sense to still have some fixed income exposure. We just think rates keep going a little bit higher early in the economic cycle. Stocks will probably do better. And if you want to get real geeky with some of this stuff, if you keep having higher trending uh, 10-year yield, we need 10-year yield and go between 175 and 2% by the end of this year. Um, if that happens, more, something like mortgage-backed securities can do really well when yields go higher. Also, bank loans and bank notes, uh, those can kind of hang in there and do a little bit better on the fixed income side of things. So I think we probably are about done here. 
the journey continues. A long way to go. I'm honored you guys uh, invited me to come uh, speak. Um, it, it means a lot. Hopefully, you, hopefully you lacked a little bit, learned a little bit. Um, you know, again, you're in really, really good hands. I'm honored that um, you know to know you guys are in good hands. And let's leave on a positive note because I like to do that. I kind of hinted at some of this stuff. A bunch of highs, of market all-time highs, happen in clusters. And this is kind of like that secular bull market I started with. But look at this. We didn't see any new highs for like two decades after the financial crisis. I'm sorry, after the um, crash of 29. 50s and 60s, a bunch of new highs, all right? 70s, not so much. 80s, 90s, a bunch of new highs. In the 2000s, you had like nine new highs in all the 2000s. And now we just started another cycle of new highs. And guys, I see us as 26 new highs on the far right for this year. Actually, we're up to 33. We've got 33 new highs this year, matching the 33 new highs from last year. Who knows? Today could be the 34th new high. The key thing being... History tells us those green boxes tend to last a lot longer than you might think. So we could have a lot of new highs uh, still coming down the road. Lastly, do not forget how lucky we are. Harvard did a study. One in 400 trillion is the odds of being born. That's like your, your mom meets your dad, your grandpa, or grandma, all the wars and famines, all the horrible things that have happened throughout history. Just the fact that we're born, it's one in 400 trillion. And then the fact that we're born now during the richest, safest country in the world, um, you know, is just even better. Obviously, I see on the cake. I know what we've all gone through the past year. A lot of us have lost the ultimate, uh, you know, but but we've all struggled. Um, but we're on the other side. Things looking better. One in 400 trillion, to put this in perspective, you see the globe there. If you take one of those circular lifesavers, throw it in the water, and you have one dolphin, and you tell him to pop his nose up out of the water anywhere in the seven oceans, if he pops his nose up out of that circular uh, lifesaver, that's about one in 400 trillion. That's the odds of being born. So, you know, things aren't always great. I've got a 13-year-old daughter I want to strangle half the time, I'm aware, you know, but, um, you know, we got to remember we're lucky. We're all lucky, and you guys are very lucky that you're in really good hands, and hey, um, the economy looks good. Stock market's going up. That's what I was come to, came to talk about. Let's uh, let's do some Q and A. So thank you for having me. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, Lauren and I were texting. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Like this was. <laughs> I, I've been doing this twenty years, and it's not often we can sit and smile and laugh and learn a ton uh, uh, when we're talking about markets and, and the economy. So thanks so much for that. Uh, I, I know we had some questions submitted prior. Uh, maybe we'll we'll start with a couple of those. I had a couple that that maybe I'll share, but um, let's jump right into those because yeah. we're, we're we're so fortunate to to have you here. And uh, let's just keep getting some additional nuggets uh, of, of information. So, Lauren, I'm going to turn it over to you if you want to okay. run through those, and then I'll chime back in uh, just to maybe. Uh, to kind of bring everything else together. Great. great. Sure, sure. So one question that we got was, what are the areas of, of, of concern a long-term investor should have with the level of debt the U.S. government is currently in? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not on mute. Yeah, we're good. Um, I, I'm <laughs> coughing a little bit there. I talk so much. I get excited. All <laughs> time. Throat, it's really dry, but I, I just drank some water, so I'm good. Um, <laughs> the question of debt is one that comes up every time, and I, I we get it. Right. But if you look at the level of debt in the U.S., yes, it's a record high. But did you know that overall net wealth in the United States is actually one hundred thirty seven billion? So in other, that's an all time record. So debt's really high, but net wealth is really high. And that's the U.S. government's debt. Consumers. Right. You know, FICO scores went up during this financial crisis. All right. Uh, credit card debt went down during this financial crisis. Businesses, corporations, individuals are actually in a lot better shape. I and mean, we gave people money that didn't hurt. Right. But still, people are in a lot better shape as it pertains to debt. And the truth is this, our country's had a lot of debt for a long time. I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong. Um, you know, in 1972, when the US was um, had gold, was on the gold standard, right, Bretton Woods, we severed that, okay, in 1972. Uh, John Conley, the Treasury Secretary for Richard Nixon, and the way the story goes, in the room full of bankers, Conley says, listen, we're severing gold from a uh, US dollar. US dollar is gonna free float no more to, the, to gold. Made everybody mad. He said, you know what? It's our currency, but it's your problem. And the sad truth is that's been our policy about debt ever since. We're going to take on more debt. We've got the world's reserve currency. Back in uh, March last year, when everything's getting killed, even gold was down a lot in March last year. People were panicking, selling everything. Um, the one thing that went up was U.S. dollar. That was a harsh reminder that the U.S. dollar is the, I guess we'll call it the cleanest shirt and a dirty laundry, you know? Um, but but as long as we have that, it's... um. 
we're going to continue to leverage debt. And again, with rates low like they are, you can finance debt. I mean, we actually paid less in the United States on our debt last year, adding trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars than we did in 2015. How is that possible? We have a bunch more debt. Yes, but it's because rates are lower. Now, I totally get it. If the 10-year year went to 5%, what in the world would that mean? That could mean some bad things. Um, you know, But we've actually talked a lot about debt. Um, at LPL Research, and you know, if you guys want to reach out to Brandon, and I, I can send some of the the many many um, reports we've done on debt, talking about some of these things. But we get it. Debt and inflation are two two big concerns. It's just we don't think uh, it's kind of apples to oranges when you say debt's high, but everything else, of course, debt's high. You're making more money too, right? So it kind of makes sense. Uh, I call that denominator blindness. Uh, you have to look at the denominator. Denom denominator is going up too, right? Net wealth is really going higher. So tough question, no good answer, but that's kind of how we see it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, another one, where are the biggest risks in current markets for another financial crisis or tech, bug tech bubble yeah. type market decline? Yeah, well, good news. I mean, obviously, I just talked about it. We, we don't see quite a next bubble yet. Right. I mean, you know, famous last words, I'm aware. But, um, you know, the things that concern us we're going fast. I talked about it, right? Things are going fast. If I see the Tour de France, you know, that mm. terrible crash that happened because a lady had the sign. When you're going too fast, one little mistake, one little thing, you can have a big catastrophe coming from that. Um, you know, we don't anticipate a double digit or double dip recession. I just hopefully made that pretty clear. But the last time we had a really short recession, we had a six month recession in the early 80s. All right. We just had probably a six month recession this time. We had a double dip recession then. So sometimes when you when you grow fast out of a, out of a crisis and you don't have the normal imbalances worked out like we usually do in a recession, that's when you can trip back and stub your toe, especially when you're going fast. So that's there a policy mistake on the Fed. I mean, I just said we don't see massive inflation. That's what the Fed says. What mm. if the Fed's wrong? Right. If the Fed's wrong and there is massive inflation, they have to hike rates sooner. That could kind of pop. I'm not saying pop the bubble. I don't feel like it's a bubble, but that could pop some things. Um, so those are some of the things that kind of have us um, up at night a little bit. Gotcha. OK, thank you. And um, last one, what are your feelings on Bitcoin, NFTs and other digital assets or investments? Um, are they a short term trend or are they here to stay? Give a recommendation, but I think they're here to stay. And here's what the way I look at it: in the um, internet bubble, Amazon went down like 98 percent. Amazon, like the world's biggest company, Amazon went down 98 percent. All right, there's going to be crashes, there's going to be burns. A lot of them aren't going to make it, aren't going to work. But at the end of the day, you know, a decade or two from now, some of them very well might. Now, does that mean you want to start putting a bunch in your portfolios? Probably not. Okay, there's, you definitely. Make these decisions, um, you know, with with money you can. Ex if you lost it tomorrow, you could live with. But there could really be some opportunity there in, in in some of these coins. And again, it's it's one of those things like so many people have been betting against it for a long time. These cryptocurrencies. I mean, look what China's done. Just the last few weeks, China's cracked down on the people that are trying to mine these coins. Um, yet it's not going away. Um, so again. It, it's not a recommendation, but again, I think it's like the internet where we had no idea. Like I can, you know, control my, I'm six miles from my house. I can open my garage door from my phone right now. You know, who thought of that with the internet 20 years ago? You know, where these things can go, you just don't know. But again, there, there is, a, there is some potential there in, in some of those, some of those coins and they're really confusing. I don't understand it. I mean, I don't know if anyone truly does, um, but, but clearly there's going to be some winners when all is said and done, but there's also going to be some big time losers. I mean, you know, we all use pets.com, you know, there's crop companies that simply don't exist anymore, but then there's the winners and that's, um, you know, that's kind of a market, I guess, also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very apt way to put it. <laughs> um, Brandon, I know that you said you had a couple as well. Just and and with just one more. So you know, one of our, our longer term themes is is just the amount of innovation and technology and disruption. Yeah. Uh, can you just talk on that a, a little bit? Uh, on just and you know, similar to what what you had said, right? I mean, Amazon sold books twenty years ago, and now they're mm -hmm. the biggest company in the world. Can you just talk about you know maybe what LPL research sees or how that can continue to play with the amount of innovation and how fast that's happening now versus where it was 10 and 20 years ago. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know there's, there's tons, tons of negatives from what we just went through, right? Well, right. We, we, we know, know that, that. but, um, but um, uh oh, 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 maybe oh, hit mute there. Okay, there we go, sorry, yep. Okay, so what would we also know? We had more innovation in the last 12 months and we would have had probably the five years combined, right? I mean, just the different ways that we uh, thought through and, and made things happen. So innovation 
it works both ways too, right? It can be too much too fast and you can have some potential stumbles. But, you know, just the fact that we had a vaccine, you know, it took Moderna like two days. I didn't know this. It took Moderna like two days to make that vaccine. I mean, isn't that the craziest thing you ever heard? It took a long time to get approvals and everything. But the, the way that, you know, we kind of went through this and 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 use ingenuity and use just grit and resolve and, and new evolutions and new technologies, it really is fascinating. And now we're on the other side of it and we're going to start to see it. But I'll tell you guys what you just talked about. One of the negatives is the, how fast we are going. Right? I do a lot on social media. You can follow me on Twitter, this and that. I mean, there's so many opinions. And there's so many things flying around. What really matters, right? I mean, you can get lost in the shuffle of all the stuff that's happening. And I, I love what's happening, but I think also it's got to be smart. That's why when you get your newspaper, you open it up and you're going to read whatever the headlines are, going to get your attention, going to get your worked up a little bit. That's normal. But you have to, to kind of decipher, you know, this is a long term investment. It's a long term horizon. If I, if I think stocks are going to be higher 10, 15 years from now, I shouldn't be panicking because there's a 6 percent correction because of whatever the news of the day is, um, you know, to use that as an opportunity and keep going. So it's a fast world, but sometimes we got to think slow to make make it successful. And that's um something I try to do every day and I'm the guy running around out of breath half the time. So I need to work on that as, just as much as anybody I'll admit. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, just to kind of wrap things up here. Uh, we so appreciate you coming on and speak, taking the time to speak with us and mm -hmm. share this information with our clients. Like, like Brandon said, I don't know if I've had um, one of these where I've laughed out loud. I'm alone in my apartment. And if anyone were here, they would think that I've like lost my mm -hmm. mind because I was laughing so hard during. So good. All um, right. <laughs> it means I did it right. That's good. It's hard doing this when no one's looking at you. I'm like, oh God, are they laughing at this joke? You don't know. You know, I just, I just keep rolling. I just keep doing it. No, it was, it was <laughs> great. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I think that, um, you know, if anything, just you know, as someone I handle the marketing for the firm, I'm not in the thick of making investment decisions every day, but just as so I think as kind of a layman in the even in, still in the industry, like this just was very like filled with hope and positivity. And I think it's exactly what everybody needed to hear. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us and share that. Um, just to give everybody a little bit of a preview for next month's webinar in July, we are going to be talking about protecting your data with Sheridan Colhane from uh, MFS. We're super excited to talk about that. It'll be a great one to have, um, even if clients want to invite their parents or their children to watch it. I think this is something, an issue that affects everyone as we move into a more and more digital world. And um, Again, if anybody has any questions that they would like to send our way after the fact, you can reach us at team at kennedyfg.com. And uh, thank you all so much for joining us, Ryan. Thank you again so much. Mm -hmm. And I hope everybody has a fantastic day.